Hey everyone and welcome back to the deep dive. Today we're diving into a topic that's been generating a lot of buzz, especially in the crypto world. Perpetual futures. Oh yeah, perpetual futures, they're really shaking things up. So let's start with the basics. For any listeners who might be new to this, what exactly are perpetual futures? Well, in a nutshell, perpetual futures contracts are like traditional futures contracts, but with a twist. They don't have an expiration date. So imagine a market that's always open, always moving. That's what perpetual futures bring to the table. Always open. That sounds pretty intense. It can be. And it definitely demands a new way of thinking about trading and pricing these contracts. And that's where our deep dive comes in. We'll be looking at a research paper that tackles these very questions. Thank you for tuning in to Quantopian's Quant Radio, your AI-driven podcast exploring everything related to quantitative finance. If you enjoy this episode, don't forget to like and subscribe to stay updated on future releases. For more quant-focused content, join us at community.quantopian.com. There you can explore a wealth of resources, connect with fellow quants, engage in insightful discussions, and enhance your skills through our extensive range of online courses. Quant Radio is intended to help people develop their knowledge and skills in quant finance. This podcast is not intended to provide investment advice. And now, back to the episode. Perpetual Futures Pricing, a brilliant piece of work by Acker, Huguenair, and German. Right. And these researchers actually took two separate papers they wrote in 2023 and merged them into this one for 2024. A testament to the collaborative nature of academic research. Absolutely. So before we get into the nitty gritty of their findings, I think it would be helpful to understand why everyone's so excited about perpetual futures in the first place. Oh yeah, there's a lot of excitement and for good reason. One of the biggest draws is their sheer simplicity. Remember how in traditional futures, you have to constantly roll over your contracts as they expire. Oh, tell me about it. It can be such a headache. Well, with perpetual futures, that hassle is completely gone. It's one continuous market making trading so much more streamlined. So no more scrambling to close out expiring positions at the last minute. Exactly. And that's not all. This continuous market also fosters enhanced liquidity. Enhanced liquidity. So that means would... there's a larger pool of buyers and sellers constantly interacting, which makes it much easier to execute trades quickly and at a price that's more reflective of true market value. That makes a lot of sense, especially in the crypto space, where things move so fast. It's essential. It allows traders to react to news and events in real time without being constrained by, you know, those pesky traditional market hours. Right. So we've got no rollovers and enhanced liquidity, two big wins for perpetual futures already. But you mentioned something earlier about pricing these contracts. And I know from the paper that there's this concept called funding payments that plays a crucial role. What exactly are funding payments and why are they so important in this perpetual world? OK, so funding payments, they're kind of like the heartbeat of the perpetual futures market. They're the mechanism that helps ensure the futures price stays aligned with the spot price of the underlying asset. This alignment is also known as the basis. So they act as a sort of anchor, preventing the futures price from drifting too far from reality. Exactly. And they do this through a clever system of payments between traders. Think of it like a constant tug of war between those who are betting on the price going up, the longs, and those betting on it going down the shorts, with these funding payments acting as the rope. OK, I'm starting to get the picture. But how do these payments actually work? What determines whether buyers pay sellers or vice versa? It all boils down to the difference between the futures price and that spot price we talked about. If the futures price is trading at a premium to the spot price, meaning it's higher, then the traders who are long will pay a funding payment to those who are short. Ah, so it's like a built-in incentive to keep the market balanced. Precisely. And if the futures price is trading at a discount, meaning it's lower than the spot price, then the reverse happens. The shorts pay the longs. Interesting. So this funding payment system ensures that the market doesn't get too carried away in one direction or another. Exactly. It helps to keep things in check, even without that traditional anchor of an expiration date. That's really clever. So is that all there is to these funding payments? Just this premium or discount element based on the basis? Well, not quite. There's one more piece to the puzzle. Funding payments also take into account the interest rate differential between the two currencies involved in the contract. Interest rates, huh? So even in this futuristic world of perpetual contracts, we can't escape the influence of good old interest rates. Nope, they're always lurking. But in this case, they actually play a 
pretty important role. By including this interest component, funding payments ensure that holding a perpetual futures contract is roughly equivalent cost-wise to actually holding the underlying assets themselves. That makes sense. So it's like creating a level playing field, whether you're trading in the futures market or dealing with the actual asset. Exactly. Keeps things fair and prevents arbitrage opportunities. Okay. So far, so good. But I know that perpetual futures contracts come in different flavors, right? Mm -hmm. Didn't you mention something about linear and inverse contracts? What's the difference and why does it matter to traders? You're right. There are different types of perpetual futures contracts, and understanding the distinction between linear and inverse contracts is crucial. All right, let's break it down then. What are the key differences between these two types of contracts? Sure. With linear contracts, the margin and settlement are both denominated in the, quote, currency. Let's say you're trading a Bitcoin dollar perpetual future. In a linear contract, your margin and any profits or losses would be calculated in dollars. So if I'm used to trading in traditional markets where everything is typically quoted in dollars, linear contracts might feel more familiar. Exactly. But in the crypto world, inverse contracts are very popular. In these contracts, everything is denominated in the base currency, which in our example would be Bitcoin. Yeah. So if I'm a diehard Bitcoin enthusiast and want to keep all my trading within the Bitcoin ecosystem, Inverse contracts would be the way to go. You got it. It lets you stay crypto native, if you will. A really good example is the BitMEX BTThist contract. You're speculating on the ETHist exchange rate, but everything, your margin, profit, loss, it's all in Bitcoin. Whoa, that's fascinating. It's like having a parallel financial system operating entirely within the crypto world. In a way, it is, and it highlights just how innovative and adaptable the crypto space can be. This is all incredibly interesting, but I have to admit, my head's starting to spin a little with all these new concepts. We've got funding payments, linear and inverse contracts, and I know from the research paper that there's a lot more complexity to uncover when it comes to actually pricing these perpetual futures. Oh, we're just getting started. I was hoping you'd say that. I'm still trying to wrap my head around all this perpetual future stuff, but I'm ready for more. Great, because now we're going to really get into the weeds of how these contracts are actually priced. Okay, bring on the weeds. I'm feeling brave. All right. Well, remember those funding payments we talked about, the ones that keep the futures price in line with the spot price. Yeah, like a constant tug of war, right? Exactly. Now, let's focus on linear contracts for a moment. Remember how funding payments have those two components, the premium based on the difference between the futures and spot prices, and then the interest rate differential. Uh-huh. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. Two prongs to keep everything honest. Right. Well, what's really interesting is that if interest rates are constant, exchanges can actually perfectly anchor the futures price to the spot price just by adjusting that interest factor in the funding payment. Wait, really? Just by tweaking that one little thing? Yeah. The researchers, Ackerer, Huguenier, and German, they figured this out. They found that if the exchange sets the interest factor to exactly match the difference in interest rates between the two currencies, boom, the futures price will mirror the spot price perfectly. That's amazing. So it's like the exchange has this magic dial they can turn to keep the perpetual futures market right on track with the spot market. Pretty much. And what's cool about this is that if the futures price is exactly tracking the spot price, you can actually perfectly replicate a perpetual futures contract by just trading the underlying assets themselves. Whoa, that's like financial alchemy or something, turning one thing into another. But wait, in the real world, interest rates aren't usually constant, are they? You're right, they're not. And when interest rates aren't constant, things get a bit more complex. The perpetual futures price basically becomes this weighted average of future expected spot prices. Weighted average, meaning some future spot prices have more influence on today's futures price than others. Exactly. And the weights are determined by, you guessed it, the funding rate. Funding rate is everywhere. It's the key to everything. So the higher the rate, the more weight is given to near-term expectations of the spot price and less weight to those further out in the future. So it's like the market is saying, hey, What's happening right now is more important than what might happen way down the line. Precisely. It's a discounting mechanism that prioritizes the present. Gotcha. So we've talked about how this works for linear contracts. What about inverse contracts? Is it the same idea? The logic's pretty similar, but remember, with inverse contracts, everything's flipped. They're margined and settled in the base currency, so the roles of the interest rates are reversed. Oh, right, right. So if the interest rate on the base currency is higher than the, quote, currency then we'd expect the inverse futures price to be higher than the spot price. 
bingo. And as the funding rate climbs higher, that difference shrinks. And just like with the linear contracts, the futures price will eventually converge towards that spot price. Okay, so no matter what kind of perpetual future we're talking about, understanding the funding rate is absolutely crucial. Couldn't agree more. It's the heartbeat of the perpetual market. So we've covered linear, we've covered inverse. But didn't you mention something about other, even more exotic perpetual instruments earlier? Something about quanto futures? Those sounded pretty wild. Ah, yes, quanto futures. Now, those are where things get really interesting. They add a whole other layer of complexity because they involve a third currency. Three currencies. My brain might explode. But okay, I'm game. Tell me more about these quanto futures. All right, so with a quanto future, you're basically making a bet on the exchange rate between two currencies. But the catch is that the margining, the settlement, and all those funding payments, they all happen in a third currency. So let's say, hypothetically speaking, I was really bullish on the euro against the dollar, but I wanted to use Bitcoin for my margin and settlement. That's where a quanto future would come in, right? You got it. It basically allows you to gain exposure to one exchange rate while operating entirely within a different currency's ecosystem. Pretty cool, huh? Super cool, but also sounds incredibly complicated. How do you even begin to price something like that? It definitely gets more complex, but the key is to really consider those correlations between all three of the exchange rate pairs involved. You need a really good model for exchange rate dynamics to do it right. So unlike those linear and inverse contracts where we could use those nice, neat little formulas, pricing quanto futures requires a much deeper understanding of how all these different exchange rates interact with each other. Exactly. You need more sophisticated models, more calculations. It's definitely a step up in terms of complexity. But for those who can really grasp the nuances, quanto futures can offer a very powerful way to trade on a global scale. Okay, I can definitely see why those are considered more of an advanced topic. But wow, we've covered so much already. Linear contracts, inverse contracts, funding payments, all this stuff about interest rates and exchange rates. Is there anything else we need to explore in the world of perpetual instruments? Well, actually, there's one more fascinating instrument I think we should touch on, everlasting options. Remember how we talked about perpetual futures being like a continuous market that never expires? Well, everlasting options take that concept and apply it to options. Okay, hold on. Perpetual options. So not only is the market perpetual, but the option itself never expires. You got it. And that's where the everlasting part comes in. It could keep paying out potentially forever based on some function of the underlying asset's price. Whoa, that is wild. Can you give me an example of what one of these everlasting options might look like? Sure. Imagine a contract that paid out the square of the Bitcoin price every single day, forever. That would be an everlasting option. And its price would depend on all those things we've been talking about, the expected future path of Bitcoin's price, the funding rate, other market factors. So it's like you're not just betting on whether the price of Bitcoin will go up or down. You're betting on the magnitude of those movements. Precisely. You're essentially betting on the volatility of Bitcoin and how that volatility might evolve over time. Okay, my brain is officially fried. This is all incredibly fascinating, but man, there's a lot to unpack here. I know, right? Perpetual futures, everlasting options, funding rates, all these complex interactions. It's a lot to digest. It is. So what do we do with all of this? Where do we go from here? I think we've laid a really good foundation for understanding this whole new world of perpetual derivatives. But you're right, it's a lot to take in. Maybe we should take a moment to just reflect on the broader implications of all of this and what it might mean for the future of finance. It feels like we're just scratching the surface of what's possible with these things. Yeah, these instruments are already changing the game in crypto, but I think their impact is going to be felt far beyond that. You really think so? Like, where else could we see these perpetual contracts taking hold? Oh, I think it's just a matter of time before we see them in traditional financial markets, too. Hmm. Interesting. Why do you think that is? What's driving that kind of interest? Well, first off, think about the convenience factor. No expiration dates, no rollovers. It just makes trading so much smoother. Yeah, I have to admit, I'm not a fan of those rollovers either. Simplifying things is always a good thing. Exactly. And with all the trading activity concentrated in one perpetual contract, you get that enhanced liquidity and more accurate price discovery. Right. Right. So it's easier for traders to get in and out of positions mm. and they can be more confident about the prices they're getting. Exactly. And I think as those advantages become more apparent to people in traditional markets, we're going to see a ton of innovation in the perpetual derivative space. Oh, I like where this is going. What kind of innovations are you thinking about? Well, for starters, imagine perpetual futures on things like oil or gold, 
or even like economic indicators, inflation, GDP growth, that kind of stuff. Whoa. Perpetual futures on economic data. Mm -hmm. That would be pretty wild. Right. It'd be like having a market that's constantly pressing in those future expectations. But honestly, the possibilities are endless. As technology keeps developing and financial engineering gets even more sophisticated, I think we're going to see some really creative and interesting perpetual instruments emerging. It's exciting stuff for sure. But like with any new financial innovation, I guess there are some risks to consider too, right? We don't want to get too carried away with all the potential and forget about the downsides. Oh, absolutely. And one of the biggest risks with perpetual futures is the potential for market manipulation, especially in markets that aren't as tightly regulated. Yeah, I can see how that could be a problem. Because of how that funding rate can influence the futures price, there's this incentive for big players to try to game the system and push the price in a direction that benefits them. Exactly. And another thing to keep in mind is that these instruments can be pretty complex. It can be tough for investors who aren't as experienced to fully understand all the nuances. So education is going to be super important, right? Mm. Making sure people really understand what they're getting into before they start trading these things. Absolutely. Transparency is key too. making sure all the information about these markets is readily available so people can make informed decisions. Well said. So it seems like we've got this incredible potential for innovation and efficiency with perpetual derivatives, but also some inherent risks that need to be carefully managed. It's going to be really interesting to see how this all plays out as these instruments become more mainstream. Yeah, the future of finance is evolving right in front of us, and perpetual contracts are definitely going to be a big part of that. Well, this has been a fantastic deep dive. I feel like I've learned a ton about the mechanics, the advantages, and... Yeah, even the potential risks of these revolutionary instruments. It's been a pleasure talking with you about all of this. It's such a fascinating area, and there's so much more to explore. For sure. And for any listeners who are ready to dive even deeper into this world of perpetual futures and everlasting options, be sure to check out the resources we've linked in the show notes. There's a ton of great information out there to help you keep learning. And as always, remember to do your own research, manage your risk carefully, and never stop learning. Couldn't have said it better myself. Thanks for joining us on The Deep Dive, everyone. We'll see you next time for another exciting journey into the world of finance.